Hello everyone. Today I have something a little different. In the last couple of videos we've been looking at the Color Computer 1 and I want to take a little segue from that, although we will go back to the Color Computer. Uh, but I want to talk about this Commodore 64 that I got recently. A friend of mine gave this to me. It had been sitting on the shelf for years and uh, he wasn't even sure 100% where this came from. It was just something that was on the shelf stored with a bunch of other stuff. And rather than just look at this as another Commodore 64, and I know there are tons of videos out there talking about the Commodore 64, looking at what it does, its specs, um, fixing it if it's broken, all of those kinds of things. But I want to look at something just a little different, and what I want to look at is the history of this machine and there are some clues on and in this box about when and where it came from. And I always enjoy that when I get a hold of a new computer, especially if it's complete in box like this. It, it, the stuff that comes with it tells a story that's uh, far beyond just the computer itself. And to start with, I want to look just up here in the corner of the box. You'll notice a price tag and some stickers. And this tells me a couple of things. First of all, I'm looking at what's left of this price sticker, and I can see that its original price is marked at $595. This could indicate to me that this is a fairly early release because this was the retail price that the Commodore 64 was originally released at. And then I noticed down here that they have a sale price of $439.97. And as many of you know, uh, the price of the computer uh, continued to fall over the years when they were having the big price competition between uh, Commodore and Atari and TI and, and other small home computer manufacturers. And eventually this unit uh, would have been down to $199. In fact, in pen written here, and uh, the $439.97 price is scratched out, and $199.97 is the new price that's written in. So this computer went into inventory at the store at the full retail price and went through a series of price drops until it landed at that $199.97. Something else interesting about this box is there's this little piece of tape on it that says Jafco. And if you're from the Pacific Northwest, you'll know what Jafco is if you were around this area oh, between the 60s all the way up to the early 80s. Jafco was actually a catalog store. And you might think of it kind of like Montgomery Wards or Sears, but with a little different twist. While they published a catalog, if you went to the actual store, you didn't pick up an item off the shelf and go buy it like you would at a Sears or Montgomery, Montgomery Wards. You had to take a number to a back counter and then they would get it out of a warehouse for you. So it was more of a showroom for the catalog and then they would bring your merchandise out. And in the old days, I remember buying things at Jafco. Um, in fact, I bought an Atari 2600 new uh, from Jafco back I think in around 1980, maybe 79. So this gives us a clue of where, of where the computer came from. And Jafco was actually more of a Pacific Northwest thing. They had their stores in Oregon and Washington and didn't really get out um, to a lot of the rest of the country. Jafco was eventually bought by a bigger chain called Best and that's probably more popular across the United States and more people will know Best than would know Jafco. But Best worked in the same way. It was a catalog showroom store. You went in and uh, picked your slip up off the display item, took it, and uh, someone at the warehouse area or the warehouse counter would bring your merchandise up. And then at Jafco, what they would do, this little sticker that's on here, that was your kind of evidence that you had paid for your package and a lot of times it would be taping a copy of the receipt to the box. So that was sort of your proof that you'd paid and weren't just walking out of the store with something. So that's kind of interesting to me that you, we can see this little piece of history on this box. Now the box 
It does have the system serial number on it, P00303535. And I have no idea if that's an early model or late model or what that is. But uh, what is interesting is I've taken a look at the serial number on the system in the box. It does match. So this is the original carton for this system. And popping open the box. Now one of the things that's interesting is the power supply. So we've seen the... Uh, if, if you've followed a lot about the Commodore 64 power supplies, you know that these are the can be the brick of death for your computer because as the voltage regulator in these wear out, the voltage climbs up and eventually it starts killing chips inside the Commodore 64. So as the voltage creeps up from 5 to 5.5 to 6, you start kind of having a failure of chips and usually... Uh, these will die fairly quickly because I guess the memory chips are the first to go. So um, hopefully people aren't leaving these things plugged in and turned on when they're in a non-operational state and just continuing to cook all the chips in here. But sometimes the, the RAM chips are your canary in the coal mine that warn you um, that you've got a problem. And of course, the RAM chips will end up cooking. Now this is not one of the later uh, bricks that has the epoxy in it. They make a type of power supply that is uh, just potted in epoxy. So it's just a big chunk of epoxy with electronic components embedded in there. And those are, are pretty much um, impossible to service. This particular model I know still has um, problems with maybe drifting voltages or over voltage with time. But what's interesting is it does have screws in it that are removable and then it just has kind of a very thin, um, almost kind of fused joint uh, around the box here. But I believe that that can be um, cut apart or broken free and then reassembled using the four screws. So this is not potted in epoxy and would be semi-serviceable. I don't plan on using this, however. Um, I do have modern power supplies so that I can just uh, leave this in the box as a historical uh, item of interest and not take a chance on it doing harm to any Commodore 64. The system also comes with a really crisp and beautiful manual. This is just in excellent shape, just a little bit um, discolored, um, a little more of a, of a beige than a, a white sheets now for the pages but it just has a nice, crisp, glossy cover. Um, really nice manual. And then there are the other normal accessories in the box with the, with the TV switch, still with its piece of tape attached, uh, the cable for the video, and then the system itself. We'll pull that out. And just like we saw in the box, it does have the matching number, P00303535. And the bottom is not in too bad of shape. All the feet are there um, and such. But as we look at the top, uh, there is some discoloration. You can kind of see it's, it's pretty yellow along the edge, which is not too surprising. But overall, it doesn't look like it is in too terrible of condition. Um, the white lettering on the keyboard is now a little bit uh, orange, which is interesting. So this is probably a good candidate for some cleanup and retro brighting. Um, and that's something that I might do, but that's far from the first thing that I'm worried about, um, given that I don't even know the operational state of this yet. So. My first guess would be, if this thing has been sitting in a box for years, is that I'm betting it is not operational. And I am interested to open this up and take a look inside and get an idea of the board revision and the dates on the chips and kind of get an idea how early of a system this is. 
And people that know more about the Commodore 64 versions than I do might be able to tell by things like the uh, logos and such as that. This one is a, is a molded logo. Uh, it isn't one of the ones that's just simply the, the metal tag, the flat metal tag. Um, again, the price stickers indicate to me that this might be an early model as well. Well, let's get this box out of the way and the other materials and take a quick look inside this unit. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull the keyboard connector loose and the power LED. And we'll just rock that backwards and take a look at what we have. Okay, there are definitely indications that this is an early board. We'll see if we can get this up here and somewhat into focus. One of the things you'll notice, it says that this is a Rev 326298 Rev A. And this board came in um, revisions A through C. And so this would be a pretty early board. Now the good and the bad to this is that it's very collectible. Uh, people like these early boards just from that standpoint. But some of the problems I understand these early boards have is that they have some of the poorest quality video of any Commodore 64. And um, additionally, there were some other reliability issues with this. Looking at the chips on board, uh, most of them are dated 82 or early 83. So there's a, another sign that this is an early unit. And uh, I think this has been a part before, and the reason I think that is there is no cardboard RF shield in it. So whoever owned it in the past has more than likely um, tossed that out and may have been in this because it had some kind of a problem. One thing that I do want to check out before going further is the condition of the power supply that was packed in the box with this. I assume that is what was used with it and knowing its condition could tell us a lot about the potential condition of this system. If the voltage on the system tends to be higher than it should be on the 5 volt side, that could be an indicator that this uh, C64 could have been damaged by that power supply. So uh, I am going to plug it in to check it out and I'll just be plugging into the power connector but I will leave the power switch off. I just want to use the exposed contacts on the back of the power connector uh, to, to measure the voltages with. So let me pull in this power supply and get that plugged in. And let's get our meter and see what we measure. See if I can get in here carefully. Okay, so this supply is measuring at 5.3 volts. I know that optimally, what we would like this to do would be to measure right at five or even a little lower. If it is at 4.8, 4.9 volts, then potentially some of the chips could run a little bit cooler and uh, dissipate less power. But 5.3, from what I'm able to tell, uh, reading online, is starting to get into the danger zone for the 64. Probably it's not enough to do damage, but it is indicating that the voltage regulator in that power supply is drifting off spec. And by the time it starts hitting around 5.4, I understand that we can begin to do damage to the RAM chips in the system. Now, what that would measure under load, and if it would go higher or lower, I'm not certain and am not willing to risk finding out by turning the system on with it plugged in. So um, that tells us that yes, this is uh, 
a supply that shouldn't be used with the 64. So with this first look at this Commodore 64 bread bin, what have we learned? Uh, we've learned that it is a very early revision from the uh, system board and from the dates on the chips. We also know that from its price history, uh, from the original store tags that we found on the box for this system. It does appear that it has been opened before. We know that the RF shield is missing, and I don't believe that would be the case had this not been uh, opened up before. But it looks in pretty good shape. And uh, we know that the power supply is out of spec. And if this power supply has been used with this board and it has drifted any further out, out than our uh, testing showed, then it is very possible that there are damaged chips on the system board for this. Um, we know that the RAM chips are especially sensitive to um, that voltage running high once we get north of about 5.4 volts uh, on the system. So uh, we're going to have to see what the operational state of this is. And that brings me to uh, what's going to be in part two. In part two of the video on this system, I'll be doing some initial review of the system board voltages. Uh, we'll be checking some points, making sure that the, the voltages are correct as much as we can. I'll probably be pulling chips out of the system for that. And at the same time, we can go ahead and um, check the conditions of the chip pins and the sockets, since that's another notorious problem with the Commodore 64. So we'll basically kind of do a, a more in-depth review of the system state, and then we'll try booting it up and see what happens. We'll see if we have an operating Commodore 64, and if not, we'll figure out where to go from there. So that's basically all I have for this video. Stay tuned for part two, and thanks for watching.